Coming up on the Civil Discourse, writer, activist, Smith College professor, and public intellectual, Loretta J. Ross, discusses her lifelong fight for feminism and a more recent mission to call in the call-out culture. Along with this radical education, we've got to teach radical practices. Radical practices of forgiveness and grace and responsibility and compassion for each other. Because the most radical thing you can do is love another person who you don't necessarily relate to. Hello and welcome to the Civil Discourse. I'm your host, Paula Morantz Cohn, Dean of the Pannoni Honors College at Drexel University, speaking to you from my office at Bentley Hall in Philadelphia. Today, my guest is the social activist, professor, and author, Loretta J. Ross. Professor Ross is a longtime advocate for reproductive justice and she is currently a visiting professor of the study of women and gender at Smith College in Northampton, Massachusetts. Loretta Ross, welcome to the Civil Discourse. Thank you. And since I sent you my biography, a little bit has changed. Smith just granted me tenure, so now I'm permanently on their staff as an associate professor. Well, congratulations. Not a little edit, so, but a big change. Well, that is a big change. It, it is a big change in a way because it gives you a security that we as academics really appreciate. And I want to congratulate you. It's a wonderful honor to be on their faculty. It's a wonderful school. So your engagement with social issues dates back. It dates back to your college years, if not before. But I do know from your biography that as a 16-year-old freshman at Howard University, you were tear gassed. And was it a precipitating event for your interest in social justice? It was because you have to remember how it was in the late 60s. The actual event happened in 1970, but there was so much civil unrest because of the murder of Dr. Martin Luther King. And so I arrived in Washington, D.C. from Texas, really innocent because I didn't know anything about political issues. But Howard University was like a crash course in Black freedom work and understanding gender and all of those things. So as a 16-year-old first-year student, I became vice president of my, my class. And that was just like reading the autobiography of Malcolm X and the Black woman by Tony K. Bambara at the same time. And it went boom into my head. And so because there was so much gentrification taking place in Washington, D.C., the population was, you know, upset about any kind of injustice. And so I quickly joined the D.C. community, working against apartheid, working to end violence against women, working to stop gentrification. And so that was my wake up call. So tell me something, we'll get back to your social justice activity, and of course this is related, but I'd like to talk about your, your work in reproductive rights. You have pioneered a field known as reproductive justice theory. Can you explain what that is? Well, reproductive justice was created by 12 Black women in 1994, and I was one of them. And we knew that the pro-choice, pro-life binary was inadequate for us as Black women because it wasn't just about whether or not you have an abortion or you don't, but it really was about whether or not you got to have the children that you wanted to have under safe and healthy environments and with how you could parent your children once they were born. And so that's reproductive justice, the right to have a child, not to have a child, and to raise your children in safe and healthy environments. And so that's what we as Black women felt that we needed from the current debate on reproductive politics, because it wasn't just about abortion. I mean, I think it's interesting to use the word, the binary that had existed, that you were trying to break down or erode some of the 
uh, simplifi oversimplification that you saw or that you see in the reproductive justice movement? Yes, because there are people in the pro-life movement who support us because they also want women to, to have the right to have children and to be able to safely raise their children. And there are people in the pro-choice movement who support us because we support birth control and abortion and abstinence. And so it's a way to bridge that divide by saying we can all build a container where women's reproductive decision-making is respected without condemning each other. As long as we're in conversation with each other, we can debate. It's when we stop talking to each other that we're in trouble. I so agree, Loretta, especially when you say that you can bring together uh, pro-choice and pro-life people, because generally speaking, we don't see any place where that can happen. And it's a model, if you can do that, for many other things where one would hope that you could bring people together. Do you feel that's, <laughs> that's your mission in some ways, to bridge some of these differences? I believe so, but let's be clear. When I talk about pro-life, these are people who say, I would not have an abortion myself because it's against my value, but I wouldn't stop you from doing so. Right. So those are people I respectfully call pro-life versus people I call anti-abortion because they're not only not having abortions themselves, but they want to stop everybody else. So when your convictions extend to trying to control other people's lives, that's when I have a problem. Just like I wouldn't want anybody to impose an abortion on someone who didn't want to have one. That's an important distinction. Thank you for that. You, you've had uh, important roles in many social justice pro projects and events. Um, you've worked on a women's march on developing um, women of color program within now on an early right rape crisis center on human rights education, on an anti-Ku Klux Klan network and other such initiatives. And I wonder if there is one program or event in your vast roster that you feel particularly proud of and would want to expound upon a little bit for our audience. My boss in the 1990s, the early 1990s was Reverend C.T. Vivian who had been the aide to Dr. Martin Luther King. He was the national field director. And he said something very profound that it took me a few years to understand. And that is, if you ask people to give a page, then you have to be there for them when they do. And when he said that, my mind was blown because I was like, I'm a black woman. If I can't hate the Klan, who can I hate? I mean, <laughs> I mean the hate list is really short. And it took me doing deprogramming of people who'd been in the white supremacist movement for me to begin to see them as human beings and not just boys in the sheep. That I had to recognize their humanity and in the process I expanded my own. That I could find the humanity in the most unlikely places and in the un most unlikely people. And so I'm really grateful that Reverend Vivian bought his many years of insight to a young woman who wasn't ready to hear the, the, those uncomfortable, inconvenient truths and gave me that grace to understand that we can build a better world together if we don't use hatred as our currency. Tell me about that effort that you just alluded to where you found the humanity in a former, I guess, former Ku Klux Klan member. Is there a particular person, boy perhaps, that you recall where you can actually have the texture of that personality in your memory? Well, in terms of the Klan, I worked with a couple in Wisconsin, Ken and Carol Peterson. They had left the Klan, and I'm not quite sure why. I think it was to escape criminal activities, frankly, but they never said so. But Geraldo Rivera was interviewing Ken Peterson one night in this rigidly cold outdoor scenario. And Carol, his wife, was standing right next to me. And they had left their home so quickly they didn't bring adequate coats because when you leave the clan, you're kind of like 
you have to run because you're leaving some criminals, right? So you can't just stand in a resignation and pack up your house. I was standing in the cold. It was about 15 degrees. I was cold, warmly dressed and Carol was in shirt sleeve. And I watched her shiver for about a half hour and then realized that I couldn't stand next to this woman without sharing my coat. And so we took turns wearing the coat. And that's when I realized that at some point, your integrity matters more than your politics. That's really something. Thank you for that. So we've had a tumultuous year this year, obviously, with the pandemic and with the protests, uh, Black Lives Matter and so forth. And I know that tempers have flared and issues have gotten very volatile in various places. Right here outside of Philadelphia at Haverford College, there were issues uh, among the students and you were brought in to mediate. Could you tell us about what you saw there, how you understand it based on your experience in social justice and what role you played with that group and the result? Well, one of the things that I've been studying for the past six or seven years is the question of, instead of calling people out, what would happen if we called people in? And that's the topic of my book that I've been writing on. And so I've been doing trainings online and in person with people, teaching them calling in techniques, because a calling in is really just a call out done with love. But instead of using anger and disrespect, you're using love and honoring the humanity of the person. And so that was my interaction with Haverford, teaching them some basic techniques of how to call people in, how to put a pause on your quick negative reaction to what other people say, teaching them how to go underneath somebody's words so that you're not just stereotyping, but you keep the fullness of their complexity in your mind. Because if you're still bleeding from an emotional wound, then you're going to bleed all over the person you're trying to talk to. <laughs> and so there are real teachable techniques for redirecting a conversation into a, an exchange of our shared humanity rather than the debating in a gladiatorial way about our politics. And I'm having a ball showing people that this can be done. If I could talk to rapists and ex clansmen I could talk to somebody who gets a gender pronoun wrong. What do you think is the reason that elite schools like Smith, like Haverford um, and others uh, are the site of so much of this discord? It's not to say that it doesn't exist, obviously, in the society at large, but these schools often seem to be places where this uh, really erupts. And then uh, it, it then they become the site of a great deal of criticism by some outside of them. And I wonder if you could uh, explain what you think is going on. Well, first of all, we attract the brightest and the greatest and the most compassionate students. I mean, they go through a rigorous process to get into our elite school. So why are we surprised that they're bringing their sharp minds to all the questions that we are offering through our pedagogies? Of course they do. And so the phrase I use is that along with this radical education, we've got to teach radical practices, radical practices of forgiveness and grace and responsibility and compassion for each other. Because the most radical thing you can do is love another person who you don't necessarily relate to because we're taught that I should only care about people who know me and who I know. And instead, it is even more radical to love people who don't know you, who aren't related. I couldn't agree with you more, Loretta. I think, you know, that idea of radical compassion is something that sometimes it seems to me has been lost sight of. And that brings me to another question I want to ask you, because I want if how you place yourself with respect to the progressives of the present moment, do you align with them? Do you, I mean, the whole issue of liberalism 
seems to me to be at issue. I don't know if this is just a rhetorical thing, just words, or whether you think there is a genuine split within the left on this issue. Well, see, my little stone is human rights. I'm going to support anybody who supports human rights, and I'm opposed to anybody who violates human rights. I don't care what your economic system is, your political views, the labels you attach to yourself. That's my criteria. Are you concerned about people having the right to have enough food, health care, shelter, education, speech, you know, protection from violence? Those are the things that I care about. I care so much less about labels than outcomes. And that's what the civil rights movement taught me. I talked about Reverend Vivian. He told me that Dr. King didn't mean to build a civil rights movement. He meant to build a human rights movement. And he said so four days before he was assassinated. I've been using human rights as my foundation. I could care less about the labels. Uh, I offer just a punch in a critique of the left as I do of the right when we violate people's human rights. Do you think there is a generational divide in the way people think about human rights right now? Yeah, of course there is, because first of all, we never had quality human rights education in the American educational system. I mean, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was ratified in 1948, and yet we don't have it in our school systems, unlike Europe and other places where they are working towards really achieving and embracing the human framework. So it's hard to fight for rights you don't know you have. And so we're behind the rest of the global north in understanding a power of this global compact of compassion and understanding. We're so far behind. We can do better. We can protect our individualism. For example, what I love about the human rights framework is everybody's included because you're just human. It's not based on your identity, it's based on your humanity. And nobody gets to vote on whether you're a human being or not, you know? And so since everybody's included, it still is intersectional. Mm -hmm. Because for example, every child has a right to an education, but a blind child might need her books in braille. She doesn't have more human rights. She has special needs you have to attend to so that she can get to the same human rights. And so that's why we need to go away from these labels and talk about outcomes. Are we making sure we have a school system where that blind child can learn under a framework that says every child has a right to an education? It seems what you, as you state it, it seems so commonsensical. It seems like who could quarrel with that? Um, and yet I guess some of the terminology and labels, as you put it, have created some of the polarization that we're seeing. Well, we also unfortunately can recognize that injustice is profitable for some people. Mm. And so why would they <laughs> have an interest in dismantling systems of injustice if it makes some money? Just like these social media platforms make a million dollars every time a conspiracy theory is spread. I mean, why? What is their interest in stopping those conspiracy theories if it's making of money? Right. And your view of social media and how we can deal with it constructively and put it to the use of uh, social justice and compassion as opposed to hate and the kind of trolling that we're seeing, it seems like a very difficult problem to solve uh, without impeding free speech. Do you have thoughts about social media and how it should be controlled, if at all? Well, I want to start with free speech, which is where you included. I believe in free speech, but I don't believe in consequence-free free speech. In other words, you have the right to say whatever you want, and I have the right to say, and now you're responsible for your words. You can't just throw them out there into the universe and expect not to have consequences, no more than a death threat against somebody else is a free speech issue. Yeah, you have the right to say it, but you also, we have the right to hold you accountable for that. And so I nuanced the concept of free speech. Too many people want to hide behind free speech and cause harm to people and pay no, no consequences for it. 
So how would you, how do you connect that to this whole issue of cancel culture that the right uh, particularly is finding to be problematic because what constitutes enough to say that that person needs, is, is impinging on the rights of others seems to be a very subjective sort of thing. And, you know, that's the bone of contention on both sides. Well, I kind of like look at this whole false debate over critical race theory being taught in schools. And I'm like, this, this is such a highfalutin legal theory. Nobody K through 12 even know what we talk about. <laughs> and so, you know, when you create these false culture wars and call it cancel culture and all of that, it's hard for me to believe that you're operating in good faith. I mean, it's, I, I really- oh, Let me, can I stop you? Critical race theory uh, is something that's come under attack from some people on certain sides of this debate. Do you, you feel it's not a real antagonist or a real issue that it's been concocted? Because there are some that feel very strongly, in, in, uh, believe very strongly in it. But uh, what are we talking about? What are we don't, talking about? You don't want us to teach about the history of the Civil War and race relations but you want to critique critical race theory. So all I can do is call your theory hypocritical race theory. <laughs> <laughs> There's a reality you don't want us to teach. And, and I'm not sure how to call that. So how do, you, how do you define critical race theory? Critical race theory simply says that you have to take into account different factors when you're making legal judgments about whether a person has been harmed. Yes, they may be harmed because they're a woman, but they also may be harmed because they're black. So you have to look at the intersection of their blackness and their womanhood. You just can't say the fact that she's a woman doesn't make a difference in a, in a race case. And you can't say the fact that she's black doesn't make a difference in a gender case. It's very simple. So it's a false red herring that is being weaponized to say that it's about teaching hateness of whiteness. Actually, no, nobody who understands what we are doing hates white people. Mm. We hate white supremacy. That's the ideology. Mm. Whiteness is just an identity like any other identity, like Jewishness and Blackness and Native Americanness. And so they're falsely claiming that we hate white people when in fact, everybody should hate the ideology of white supremacy. And what about the fact, and you think this is also a red herring, the idea that all white people are being accused of, as some people have said, of being white supremacists. That's what I'm saying. I don't like people who have unsophisticated analysis because all white supremacists aren't white and all white people are not white supremacists. And if you can't understand that basic, I want to send you back to kindergarten because <laughs> you don't know how to do any kind of sophisticated analysis of how people actually are. Okay, I, I think that's very eloquent. Um, let me ask you a, a really a final question about education in elementary school and how you feel we can teach American history to our children so that they have pride in their country and also see the reality of that country. But I think it's really at the root of so much of what's being quarreled about right now. And, you know, I'm talking here about a six or a seven year old child. And how, how do you see this? And I assume that this is something you thought a lot about because, well, you've thought about a lot of things, but Education, I think, is very much front and center of your for your preoccupations. Well, my father was in the military as a lifer, so I was raised and educated in military schools. So you can imagine that patriotic culture was the backdrop of my life. I mean, Fourth of July was like the big celebration on base and those kinds of things. I think the proudest thing you can do as an American is use our freedoms to become a better country. Well, so many people can't do that around the world. And that's such a privilege as an American to say, we're good, but we're going to get better, you know, because we have the freedom to do that. 
we only started this thing 400 years ago. We made a lot of mistakes, but we also got a lot of stuff right, and we're going to do it even better in the future. That, to me, is what being a proud of American is. Not concretizing some myth of we got it all right. No, we're innovative and creative and, and patriotic enough to know, yeah, and we're going to even do it better in the future. Democracy is an evolving experiment. I'm very happy to participate in. I love your I love the way you put it. We had many good things, but we've got to be much better. And that I think is something that even the smallest child can understand. Yeah. Just because the first time you rode a bike you fell off doesn't mean you can't get better. <laughs> well, I want it. We are out of time, but I just think this has been a very insightful and sort of rousing conversation. So I want to thank you, Loretta Ross, for being with us today. All right. Well, thank you for having me on your show. And I want to thank our audience for being with us on The Civil Discourse.